Coming up next on Tech News Today, special glasses mean you too can trick facial recognition systems into thinking you're John Malkovich. Also, Facebook is ditching its ethnic affinity ad targeting. The NES Classic is every bit as good as you may remember. Uh, why GoPro should have known better with its Karma drone. And Facebook thinks everyone is dead. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1640, recorded Friday, November 11th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. And by LinkedIn Learning and lynda.com. Develop talent and keep skills current with expert-led on-demand e-learning. To request a demo for your organization or to get a free individual trial, visit learning.linkedin.com slash twit. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where, you, where we tell you everything that somebody needs to know about technology. Hopefully that's you. Uh, I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell, where you tell us something in our <laughs> feedback section, which we'll get to a little bit later. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, it's Veterans Day here in the United States. It is Remembrance Day in Canada and Australia. Around the web, people are taking a moment to thank veterans for their service. And I would like to take a minute to do that, too. So thank you. We'd also like to play a short video of one geek veteran, retired Army Colonel Shane Kimbrough, sharing his thoughts on Veterans Day, let's take a look. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough, commander of the International Space Station and a retired Army colonel. As I orbit the Earth at an altitude of 250 miles, I'm constantly in awe of the sight of our planet below. I'm equally awestruck by those brave Americans who served and who are currently serving around the world in the United States Armed Forces in the defense of our freedom. Our servicemen and women have always placed themselves in harm's way to protect our values and everything and everyone we hold precious in our democracy. I also want to recognize family members of those serving. You humbly sacrifice more than people know. Thank you. As we commemorate Veterans Day, please take a moment to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice and those currently serving on behalf of us every minute every day to keep us free, to allow us to explore and enrich the lives of others on earth. Thank you. Shane knows how to do it. <laughs> he ends with a flip uh, upside down in space. That's how you do it right there. Yeah, great <laughs> message. Um, absolutely. And I completely agree on all points. My mm -hmm. dad was in the military. My grandpa was in the military. A lot of friends and family and everything. So thank you for everything that you guys do. Uh, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University have discovered how easy it can be to trick facial recognition systems into misidentifying what it perceives as correct matches. The researchers used a special pair of glasses with a glossy printed design that effectively would trick the systems into recognizing someone with special clearance, let's say. The glasses were even put to use against commercial facial recognition systems like Face++ Plus Plus in order to simulate a scenario where someone might wish to gain access to a secret building guarded by the technology and were found to be 100% effective at tricking the system, uh, all because of a, a very specifically printed design on these glasses. It's like, and, and, and unique to a person. So, for example, um, a white male was wearing the glasses with a unique printing, you know, printed uh, design on there that successfully identified as Mila Jovovich with 87.7% accuracy just by wearing the glasses. 
That is bizarre. Isn't it weird? Yes. But I mean, if we've learned anything this week, it's the data means nothing. And <laughs> so I guess this just confirms it. Um, so this, data is fallible. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. It's fallible. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, mean nothing. nothing. It, it always means something. Does it mean the right thing? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but I love the name of this Carnegie Mellon paper, uh, Accessorized to a Crime. Mm. <laughs> so. That just was my favorite part of it. You know, accessorized, like, yeah, you know, accessory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know what just what just struck me? Maybe that's this is what spectacles are all about because this kind of looked like spectacles. They did. Uh, mm -hmm. It's possible that Snapchat knows a little something uh, that we don't know about tricking facial recognition systems. Probably not. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm guaranteeing that's not the case. Well, I, I mean, I... Uh, you know, using these glasses is much easier than the minority report way. I don't know if you remember that, but that was retina scanning. So you had to gouge right. out the eyeballs in oh, order yeah, to fool it. So this, these little paper spectacles way better than that. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like how you, how you figure this out. Like, yeah, hey, we'll just, you know, make some glasses and put a unique design on it. And the way that the design, you know, falls with the features on the face. I, I couldn't tell from, from reading this, whether it actually works in, in concert with your facial features so if it's glasses that would only work matched to my face to do it or if the glasses in and of themselves are what trick you know the uh the um ai behind the scenes i couldn't figure out what what the case is either way but regardless it's fascinating to know like to be able to figure this out that's that takes some smart people to to kind of figure out that connection faces stolen included carson daly colin powell or uh, colin powell uh john malkovich and uh yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done here, apparently, because 100% accuracy, like, uh, I don't know if you follow math, but like, it doesn't get more accurate than that. So. Like I said, data means nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Facebook says it will no longer allow advertisers to limit the reach of their housing, employment, or credit-related ads to what Facebook calls a user's ethnic affinity. The decision comes after users, law enforcement, and the Congressional Black Caucus said Facebook's actions violated the Fair Housing Act. Facebook is notoriously secret about the inner workings of its advertising and profiling algorithms. But a few weeks ago, this policy came to light after Julia Angwin, a reporter at ProPublica, took out a real estate ad and was able to exclude those that Facebook had labeled as having African-American and Asian ethnic affinities. Uh, Facebook approved the ad in less than 15 minutes. They were initially defensive of their actions. The company published a blog post today explaining that going forward, it will build tools to detect and automatically disable the use of ethnic affinity marketing for certain types of ads, and they'll offer more clarification and education around the issue. So I think this is a really good example of how Facebook uh, changes policies mm -hmm. very quickly in the face of criticism. Um, you know, we, we talk about the power that they have, but you know, if you're thinking about how fast democracy works, it's much slower than this. Yeah. <laughs> so they move fast. But I also think, um, and if you're critical of Facebook, which I mean, both of us are feeling uh, critical of Facebook right now, uh, you would say like the, they just do whatever they can uh, until they stop getting away with it. You know, they'll do whatever they can to make money. And then someone says, you know, I think that's against the law. And they say, oh, okay, we'll stop. Yeah, and like, I mean, this is one example. And of course, you know, everything that's happening right now with the kind of false stories on Facebook and that whole story that's in the news right now is another example of where when it's brought to light, Facebook's initial response is, well, there's nothing to worry about. That's This is not a problem, but whatever. At least there's that kind of introspective period and potentially on the other side, there's some sort of change uh, that kind of, you know, alters that outcome. Uh, they, you know, Facebook did reiterate in this statement that there are many ways that this could be used that were non-discriminatory, um, but that the best way to fight abuse of this type of a system is to simply remove this type of ad altogether. So, and I would absolutely agree with that on both counts. There are ways to use this that are non-discriminatory, but there are also ways as evidenced by the story from a couple of weeks ago, uh, where it could go counter to that. And I don't know, you know, there were a lot of people and I think even myself included, I, I at least had the devil's advocate on the show when we talked about the story initially about just the fact that this is, this is more a broader kind of issue with online marketing in general than it is Facebook's specific implementation of this. The, the challenge here, of course, is that Facebook is huge. And by that network effect reality, um, it almost holds it to a higher standard, whether Facebook wants to realize that or not. And that's something that that 
they and Mark Zuckerberg are coming to terms with right now, especially in light of, you know, this false stories thing. It's I think it's a kind of a theme with Facebook right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's it's very frightening to me that these people like Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey, like these people that I think of as as sort of like, you know, I don't think they're bad people, but they're certainly very similar kinds of similar age. They're white. They're male. Um, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but they're just so similar. And, you know, today there was a trending tag on Twitter. It was assassinate Trump, which is illegal. You know, it mm -hmm. is once he became a presidential candidate, if you say anything like that, it is oh, illegal. Yeah. Yeah, and there. so there were all these people saying, like, why isn't this, um, you know, why isn't this removed? Why aren't these posts removed and accusing Jack Dorsey of being, you know, too liberal? And it's like, it's like, why is that Jack Dorsey's choice? You know, it's really scary when so much of our communication is in the hands of these companies. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's frightening. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Big criticism of top of the line virtual reality systems like the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift is the tethered nature of the headsets requiring a user to be tied by wires to the computer that's doing all the hard work. HTC announced the TP cast uh, peripheral for the Vive that allows users to cast those cables aside with no noticeable latency in the experience, along with an onboard battery that can last up to around one and a half hours on a single charge. The upgrade kit costs around $220 when you factor in conversion from because uh, it's on HTC's Chinese site. Uh, it'll begin shipping to those who pre-order by early 2017. They did a pre-order on this earlier today, and it's sold out in 18 minutes. They started that at 7 a.m. Pacific. And here's, yeah, this is video of, of someone using it, um, using the system. And I don't know, I think this is this is definitely a big, big step for these kind of higher-end VR systems. You know, they're going to need to get to this wireless, cordless uh, place, particularly with the vibe where you're moving around an entire room. I can't imagine doing that Actually, I can't imagine because I experienced that at some of the conferences that we've been to. And it's weird when you get tangled up in the cord, you're, you're frozen. You don't know where you can go. I actually was surprised at how uh, how I didn't get tangled in the cord when we, we had the vibe here. But I wasn't moving around very much. Maybe it was the games that I was playing. But, yeah. I, but I get how you'd want uh, to have... Um, you know, to be more mobile when you're mm -hmm. playing you, the game and, you know, you'd want to get eventually get rid of the cameras. Like it's so involved, like besides just the cost, like setting up all these cameras in your room. Yeah. Um, so there are other companies that are involved in this. Uh, there's a company called Qu Quark. Uh, Ars Technica says they're working on a pocket Wi-Fi uh, gadget that makes the Vive wireless. But, you know, it has to be really fast Wi-Fi, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, like the slow, the latency is what causes nausea. So like, what are you giving up? You know, I would rather have, uh, you know, a cord that I was worried about um, tripping over than throw up while I was playing. Yeah, yeah if there's a, a perceptible um, difference in latency, absolutely. I would opt for the cable and not throwing up. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, this is definitely kind of the next phase. We saw Oculus at Oculus Connect showed off their, their kind of inside out wireless uh, headset uh, for tracking VR. It's definitely the next phase of this stuff. I kind of see this as like a, a nice stepping stone, a good way to kind of get halfway there with current technology before, you know, whatever the next iteration of HTC Vive happens to be. And I, I bet you anything they're working on this sort of thing uh, built into the system and not requiring, you know, an external computer and wires. Mm -hmm. Well, if your PC is slow, you might consider blaming Spotify. Users report that the music streaming app writes huge amounts of junk data to your drive. It's not uncommon for users to see 10 gigabytes added every hour. And Gadget says there is a fix and it will be coming to a computer near you very soon. So this affects Windows, Macs, Linux. Um, some are reporting terabytes of da data added to their drives. Even when you're not using the app, it's yeah. just like sitting there, you know, in, in the background, just uh, churning on data. I really want to know exactly what's going on and what kind of data that is. Yeah. I mean, if it's junk data, it's junk data. But uh, what a strange, what a strange thing to happen to your, your storage space. Mm -hmm. And what happens to it when it's removed? Is it actually, you know, deleted from your drive? I don't know. Yeah. But It's worse if you have an SSD drive. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I don't have Spotify installed on my computer because I don't, uh, I'm not really a Spotify subscriber right now. So I am saved. Maybe you are not. So you might want to check that out. Uh, sometimes the best medicine is taking a trip back in time to visit Dr. Mario. But before we talk about that, I'm excited to talk about that. Uh, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They're the sponsor of this episode. Uh, you know, 
you you might already have a house or you you think you want to get into a house by your own and there are so many great things about that whole experience but probably the downside of that experience is what it takes to get there pulling all this information from all over the place if you're not organized if you're not mentally organized i know i'm not half the time i don't know where this or that piece of information is it's it's a challenge to get it all collected bring it in and give uh the powers that be the information that they need to get that mortgage on the other side well Rocket Mortgage can help you do that. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast, powerful, and completely online. Rocket Mortgage has taken all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for mortgage out of the equation. So if you, like me, hate searching through stacks of old files and paperwork, well, with Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button. That's going to help you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. And even better beyond all that with Rocket Mortgage, you can do this from your phone or your tablet. You already have the tools that you need. They're probably in your pocket. It's a quick online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch. So if you're looking to refinance your mortgage or even to buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. QuickenLoans.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. All right, so one of the upcoming holiday season's hottest gaming gifts isn't some cutting-edge game console. It's a blast from the past. And joining us to talk all about it is Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica. Welcome back, Sam. Hello. It is good to see everybody after so long. Yes, it's great to have you back. So it looks like everyone is trying at least to get their hands on the NES Classic. Uh, you spent some time with it. What is your take? This thing looks really cool. I saw the video on Ars Technica and it made me want it even more. Well, the NES Classic Edition, uh, America, Europe, New Zealand, and Japan are each getting their own respective ones. But what they all have in common is that they are essentially a small Android system chip that is running all of your favorite old NES games, as in they've taken, we uh, we saw someone take it apart and looked at this, uh, essentially uh, a system that's more powerful than the Wii or the new 3DS, not quite as powerful as the Wii U. So uh, RAM, processor, all that stuff to run a 30-year-old game console <laughs> and 30 of its games. Um, that's kind of stuff that we, we like to wonk about, wonk out about, but you're probably not going to take it apart if you happen to get your hands on it. You're going to plug it in to an HDTV, which takes HDMI. Uh, the system has two uh, cables out of the back, an HDMI connector and a USB connector. The USB is just for power. That USB connector doesn't take any data or anything else. You cannot add games to this machine. Uh, you cannot add anything to the machine. There's no Wi-Fi. There is no USB expander. It is just, it has 30 games pre-installed, all from the original NES era that have been very faithfully reproduced. Now, anybody who's watching the video yeah. version of this show is getting to see, uh, as of right now, there's a displaying the game Bubble Bobble. Now, if you're watching it, you may look at that and go, well, that looks kind of crappy. It's got some of this um, uh, stuttering of sprites of the the little 2D characters. They're, they're sort of flashing on and off. That means this is perhaps the purest emulation of an old NES possible because the NES couldn't actually handle a certain number of sprites on the screen at once. So it would do this sort of flicker thing as a way to essentially have them at the screen on the screen every other second or millisecond. Um, and that's the really incredible thing about this emulation. Nintendo has done emulation before you've been able to go and buy old, um, NES and other system games on your 3DS, old DS, Wii, Wii U, all this sort of thing. But none have been uh, replicated this perfectly. Uh, so that's really the fascinating thing from a geek standpoint. Now, just from a simple I want to own this thing standpoint, this thing is cute. The system is a very small, I want to say five inches on its longest side, replica of the original NES style. Uh, so it's the old gray box. In fact, Japan has its own classic edition of the Famicom, which uh, has the same sort of uh, maroon and black design. Uh, this one uh, has the old gray, uh, white, and black design, and it comes with a controller that is the exact same size as the original NES controller, which is to say it is pretty small. Um, everyone is 30 years old now. 
uh, 30 years older now than uh, when it came out and may remember the size of it differently. It's not the most cozy or comfortable thing. Um, but also the, the one bummer about the system is that the cord for the controller is very short. Uh, you may be able to get a long power cord and a long HDMI cord, but the little uh, con connectors on the front uh, are the connectors that the Wii uses for its controllers. Uh, and for whatever reason, the one controller that comes with it is very tiny. Um, the, the, the cord for it is very, very tiny. So you're going to have to essentially yank it pretty far from your wall or television to your, uh, where you're going to be sitting and you'll probably be sitting on the floor with it. I think um, I know why they did that. At least well, the, the main reason, you know, exactly. We, we, we asked about, or we asked ourselves why that might be. And the reason is if you want to get into the interface, which the, the video preview showed a little bit of, of picking from these 30 games, you have to tap the power and reset buttons that have been replicated on the front of the NES Classic Edition. Uh, these control uh, whether the system is on or off, and the reset button takes you back into picking new games. Uh, in fact, when you tap that reset button on the small NES, uh, it lets you pick what's called a save state. Anyone who's ever dabbled with an emulator on their computer knows that sometimes you don't want to wait to find the save point. Uh, before running off and doing your next thing. So you would pick a save state. This is really good for games like uh, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, which is now just Punch-Out, um, to to like stop in the middle of, of your battle against the toughest guy. Mr. Dream, I believe, is his name now. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can save up to four of these little save states for any point. So you don't have to wait for the save point. It just freezes the game wherever you're at, which is a cool choice, uh, a cool touch. Uh, so uh, having used it, I will say it is faithful. It is cute. Uh, and it, for the price point, 60 bucks for 30 old classic games is not so bad. Uh, you're not going to get every game you want. Uh, for example, instead of having the um, old action game Contra, they've included the game Super C, which is the sequel to Contra. It actually uses the um, Konami code in a different way, if you're that kind of dork. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, it, you know, so the game selection all in all, it's not going to have everything you want, but it has Tech Mobile, which I loved as a kid. Yeah. It's got all three Super Mario games that were on the NES. It has both Zelda games that were on the NES. Uh, that's going to be a, a good enough point for a lot of people. Uh, and it lets you have these different little filters. It's either pixel perfect, uh, a 4-3 ratio, which was the way your old CRT TV stretched the image, or a, a scan line filter is your third option, which takes that 4-3 stretch and then adds a little bit of a filter the way that old NES games looked. So at, that's a really cool option. You're going to find a mode you like, uh, how it looks in any of those. I prefer the Pixel Perfect. Uh, I like having it exactly pixel-wise, having the perfect squares. Uh, and it displays in 720p resolution, not 1080p. That actually matters because that means you're getting an exact Pixel Perfect replication. 1080p does not quite match up with the 320 by 240 resolution of the NES in the way that 720p does. So that's another little technical thing. They really dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's in terms of emulation. This is just a very nice replication of how an NES looks. Uh, yeah, I think it's great. And if I can ever buy one, I certainly will. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, you, you said it has all the emulation, the CRT, the CRT monitor it makes me look like I'm, uh, you know, it's not a good quality. There's flashing. Will it make me feel like I'm 13 again? And will I have that same sort of teenage angst as I'm playing? Well, well, I mean, I can get into one of the reasons. There's a few nostalgic things why, but b bottom line is if you look at the list, you should just, I mean, it's very easy to Google NES Classic List to see all the names of the games. But if there's at least two favorites in there, I think you're going to be good to go. If that's if there were the things that you came back to at the end of the school day to to be a punk a little punk kid, then you should be set. I mean, everyone's going to have a favorite they're missing. Tetris is not on there, which bums me out personally. Yeah. Although the Game Boy one's better, but that's a whole another conversation. But ultimately, what's cool is they got a games that were not made by Nintendo. So Konami has two Castlevania games on there. That's pretty cool. Tecmo has Ninja Gaiden and Tecmo Bowl. Those are both pretty popular. Uh, and I think when people say playing Nintendo, that really included a lot of games that Nintendo themselves didn't make. Mega Man's a pretty huge one. And they have the, the arguably best Mega Man game, which is Mega Man 2. Uh, there's also uh, one of my uh, old favorites from when I was younger was Star Tropics, which was clearly an American styled attempt to uh, rekindle some of that Zelda thunder in which you played as a little kid, an American kid from Seattle who used a yo-yo as his weapon. Um, it's funny, though, because that one came out. When it came out, it came with a letter, 
that you needed to dip into water in order to beat the game. It was sort of an anti-rental uh, policy. They wanted you to buy the game in order to beat it, and you couldn't get the letter with the game, which is a really weird twist. Um, but Jason, do you want to talk about uh, the one of the cool things that I wrote about that Nintendo has done for this launch? Well, I mean, for, okay, so before we get to that, because oh, that, oh, see, that is really awesome, I just want to give my my theory on the short cable thing. Because when I was a kid... When I was younger, when you were playing video games on your TV, you were never sitting in your chair. You were never sitting at your couch. You were sitting on the floor in front of the TV. Mm -hmm. So I think possibly the short cable is to force you back to the point to where you have to be on the floor in front of your TV Chris just like you were when you were younger. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh that theory is busted by Nintendo's lawyers, including a little no. piece of paper in with the NES Classic, advising you how close you should be to the screen, <laughs> how often you should take a break. Uh, there was a whole lawsuit that actually makes every single video game come with things like that, but that's a whole oh. other story. But if you want to sit really close to the screen and disobey their <laughs> official legal orders, their short cord will be there for you. Excellent. All right. It will help to facilitate that. Okay, so let's talk about this because this is very cool. The, the games did not ship with the manuals. But I mean, by and large, like if you were if you gamed in this era, just playing the game was one aspect. The other aspect was like daydreaming as you looked into these manuals and figured out, learned, you know, learn the secrets of, of, of what you were playing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, apparently, these are online for everyone to, to take a look at. Right. This is one of the most interesting things I've seen Nintendo do in years is give away every manual. Yeah. for these games. They've gone in and gotten the original publication files. These aren't just rescanned old ones. These are all carefully scanned and reproduced PDFs of every single game that's included in this collection and for the Japanese one as well. Um, I was a uh, instruction manual junkie, so I'm 35. That made me quite young when the original Nintendo came out. And the big reason that my mother encouraged me to keep gaming, to not give me a lot of limits, was because she saw me reading so much. When I wasn't playing a game, I was reading about games. This was formative reading time. Uh, and these old instruction manuals, specifically the Nintendo era, and I think a lot of people have this for different game system eras, um, mm -hmm. the instruction manual, it, going back to the Infocom days of these sort of PC text adventures, adventures filled in the gaps that the game itself couldn't fill. Uh, some of the images here on the video right now are really, really colorful illustrations of characters that are a lot more detailed than the ones that were in the game. Uh, so you get these long lists of, of characters with very, um, very explicit drawings and the little on-screen looks of how they looked at, when you played. And I remember really creating these fantasies about how the game really played. Like you played it, but you had in your mind, there was still a stretch in terms of imagination mm -hmm. for these games. It's not the same as, you know, reading a book and imagining everything. But for video game playing, it's sort of interesting that this is now a nostalgic thing. Now, in my dream world, the $60 that the system costs, I would pay that $60 and get a book that reproduces all of these manuals. But for these PDFs, they're very high quality. It's a really cool thing, and it's awesome if you find the Japanese link, which we link to at Ars Technica, of all the manuals being different in Japan. Now, there's Japanese cultural differences, you know, that's a whole nother conversation, but they are illustrated uh, to some extent in the way that these books present these favorite characters in ways that the American manuals did not. Japanese manuals tend to go for this cuter style or weirder style. Sometimes they'll even be more aggressive and have things like people getting punched in the face, which Nintendo may have shied away from in the 80s while they were trying to be kid-friendly here and so on and so on but you know i think it's really easy to go and print that stuff out in pdf form in a way that you could hand this to a kid and they'll be pretty jazzed so uh, and that that is what the, i believe this is really positioning for is people really like the idea of buying this thing handing it to a kid and uh, offer sort of a, a poor man's path to doing the same thing in terms of the manuals i think is a really nice touch and i hope that people who do buy it do hit their printer up or maybe even go to a FedEx office or whatever the heck they call that place now. If anyone can get their hands on it, because right now it's sold out almost completely. Oh, well, my completely. goodness. Uh, uh, yeah, you, it would be a great stocking stuffer if only anyone could get their hands on it. Did you see that Amazon got spanked? Now, Amazon is like a leading cloud services provider. They innovated on the whole concept of websites that can survive Black Friday level traffic. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, even the NES Classic destroyed that. Uh, the shortage 
seems to be an intentional move by Nintendo. They've been perfecting that move for decades. So, uh, <laughs> you know, good luck finding one. I don't think it's worth scalping for. I don't think you should spend more than $60 for it. It has its limitations. There are other ways to make Nintendo games available for your kids. I, for one, may very well hack my own little Raspberry Pi thing and make a fake NES mini for my nephews instead yeah. of you know, going to a scalper. I don't think Nintendo will sue me for trying to spread the love of classic gaming in my own style. And I recommend anyone else who cannot find it, try and find another way around so that they can, you know, you know, what what's more twit.tv than hacking your own little Raspberry Pi enabled uh, Nintendo emulator? I, Come on. I mean, I'm you know, pretty just, sure we have a know-how episode on just that topic. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Sam Muscovich, Ars Technica, always a pleasure getting you on, man. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. See you guys next week. All right. Sounds good. See you, man. We got an email from Bill. He asks, Jason, yes. which MacBook Pro did your wife get? It uh, probably was a 13-inch, but yeah. was it with or without the touch bar? It was with the touch bar, primarily because her main goal with getting a new Mac was she didn't want the 15-inch because that was too big, but she wanted one that was going to last a long time. And the 13-inch without the touch bar had... Well, it had lesser specs, and so we went with the Touch Bar, maxed it out on the i7, I believe. Uh, so we went we went big on it. So, When's your ship date? Uh, she hasn't gotten a ship date yet, but I think Apple said that they would said they would start shipping out by next Thursday. Some people are getting shipping notifications now, so really it could be any day. Um, so I suppose we'll see. Hopefully soon. Well, after the break, can GoPro remain in the drone game? Can any American company? We'll talk to Ben Popper from The Verge to find out. But first, let's take a minute to thank LinkedIn Learning and Lynda.com, the sponsor of this episode. The shelf life of skills is less than five years, and so many of today's fastest growing categories did not even exist five years ago. LinkedIn acquired Lynda.com to bring you LinkedIn Learning. It's personalized, expert-led, on-demand e-learning from LinkedIn. LinkedIn Learning will identify the precise skills that you or your organization need needs to achieve set goals, and then they'll create personalized recommendations using LinkedIn network intelligence. Administrators are able to track learner adoption and engagement with at-a-glance analytics and downloadable reports. You'll have access to more than 9,000 courses that are taught by world-class industry experts. So whether you're interested in web design, IT infrastructure, business management, or marketing, their library offers a wide range of business, creative, and technology courses. More than 25 courses are are added weekly, such as iOS 10 app development essentials and learning Photoshop Elements 15. Topics include technical recruiting, strategic HR, small business marketing fundamentals, media training, inside sales, iOS game development, video editing, so much more. Learn anytime, anywhere with segments that can be viewed on any device, online and offline. LinkedIn Learning accommodates all learning styles. You can read course transcripts and closed captions, watch video tutorials, or listen on the go. Their bite-sized videos provide immediate problem solving and they're the perfect way to brush up on relevant skills without interrupting your latest project. Team solutions are available for as low as $2,000 per year. Grow your network and your career. Visit learning.linkedin.com slash twit to get a free individual trial or request a demo for your organization. That's learning.linkedin.com. Don't forget the slash twit. And we thank LinkedIn Learning for their support of tech news today. The biggest non-political tech news this week is the recall of the new Karma drone by GoPro. But maybe this story is political too, or it, li it might point to the trouble with American manufacturing. Joining us to talk about why GoPro drones are falling from the sky is Ben Popper from The Verge. Welcome, Ben. Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. So you write that GoPro should have anticipated these problems with its drone. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. So I think every major drone manufacturer that I can think of, DJI, Unique, Parrot, 3D Robotics, have all had similar problems with their drones, especially their first generation of drones. So this is the first consumer drone GoPro is putting out. Uh, DJI had this problem with its first two and uh, some of its other ones, the Inspire. So drones are, are hard. They're very difficult to make and to make them reliable. I think they should have expected that this kind of thing might happen and that when it did, customers might start putting it up on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you talk about, you know, we we have to restart our phones, we have to restart our PCs, like sometimes our cameras don't work. Um, but that doesn't mean that we could potentially kill someone. But I mean, that that's what happens. <laughs> like these these are toys, but they're really dangerous toys. So, I mean, no, nothing has happened yet. They're recalling, right. thankfully, before anything happened, right? 
Yeah, I mean, GoPro is doing the right thing, the right thing for the industry and, you know, the right thing for, for, for consumers. I just think it's interesting, you know, the, cons the consumer drone industry is not that old. It's only about three years old. And three or four years ago when it was hobbyists, basically, th this kind of stuff was just very routine. Oh, so you can look on the web and find videos exactly like that. That's a beautiful one. See the leaves come down? Yeah, I know. It's, it's really plants, artistic. Right? Um, it's a very stable. The camera is stable the whole time. Any consumer drone brand, you can find a video that looks just like that. Um, maybe not now with DJI and Unique because they've had a lot of generations to work on it. But um, I think... Oh, this one's great because it lands right at his feet. <laughs> Which, oh like, man, wow. like how how on earth did that happen? This one blew me away. Yeah. Um, I think one one yeah. of the things that I, I, I thought this was the guy who was flying. Around. Yeah. <laughs> God, I, can't, yeah. I can't really tell on that one. Uh, one thing that uh, kind of strikes me about this is that even though these videos are are spectacular in the in the crashing aspect of it and spell not very good things for the drone, it also seems to prove that those cameras can really take a beating. DJ has got something going with the cameras. Right. So I think they may have reached a little bit too far in what they were trying to do with a drone and a camera together. So we at our house, uh, I have kids, so they really are toy drones. And we use the SEMA drones. Like those are the $40 drones. I don't know if you've tested those, but like, you know, they're they're not made in America. <laughs> but, you know, for kids, it's right. like rather than spending $600, um, you know, it seems like to make sense. Do, and, and you say like maybe this is the end of the American made drone. I mean, do you think that um, it's just hard, it's going to be really hard for uh, for other American companies to make drones? I'm always hopeful, but. 3D Robotics tried and they got, you know, just absolutely destroyed. Again, they had, just like GoPro, uh, manufacturing problems, logistics problems, didn't deliver on time. And then when they did deliver, the drone didn't work as promised. Um, and they had to back out. And then GoPro, obviously, it seems unlikely to me, although I'm hopeful. Um, and the company and the factory are like one. They're like right on top of each other. And the engineers are all right there side by side with the factory. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Ben Popper is an editor at The Verge at Ben Popper on Twitter. Uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> of course, stay safe out there. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right, TNT's fan of the day is Mark LaViolette on LaViolette, LaViolette, I'm not sure, on Twitter, who says he listens to tech news today, every day, while at work, Mark, I know you're not alone. I mean, I don't know where you work, and I'm sure you're not alone at work, but I know you're not alone at listening where you work. Uh, <laughs> lots of people listen while they work, whether their employer wants them to or not, I'm sure, in some <laughs> cases. Show us how you watch or listen uh, to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we're going to find it. Uh, surprise, you're dead, according to Facebook. But first... <laughs> Let's take a minute to thank Tracker. They're the sponsor of this episode. We're all used to losing our possessions. I know I'm very used to losing my things. Newsweek reports the average American wastes 55 minutes a day looking for things they can't find, but that they own. They know it's somewhere. They just can't find it. Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. And I'll tell you how to get one for free. The Tracker Bravo locates misplaced keys, wallets, computers, backpacks, bicycles, even pets in seconds. I was at the roller skating rink the other night, and someone that I was talking to had a tracker on their keychain. It was awesome. The coin-sized device is constructed with anodized aluminum for the thinnest, most durable tracking. You can easily attach it to your items. There's a key loop. You can also use adhesive uh, that's included in the package. Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth LE, so the battery lasts up to one full year. You can add a laser-engraved message to each tracker bravo that that means you can turn it into like return information or use it on your pet's collar with pet info uh, you can also personalize your tracker with a custom printed image throw anything on there it looks really really sharp uh, pair tracker to your ios or android device to find its precise location with the tap of a button and uh, i mean that's really it it's that easy your phone can track up to 10 devices at one time you can also customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you leave your item behind. If you happen to lose your phone, you just press the button on Tracker and your phone's going to ring even if it was left on silent. With over 3.5 million devices shipped, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world. So your lost item is going to show up on a map even if it's miles away. And if you happen to lose your item, uh, the Tracker app actually records its last known location on a map. So when another tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of that item, you will receive a GPS update of where your item is located. So you can go get it. Go to thetracker.com and never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter promo code TNT, you'll get a free Tracker Bravo with your order. That's T-H-E, 
T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT to get your free Tracker Bravo today. And we thank Tracker for their support. Earlier this morning, Facebook was showing many living users as dead on their profile pages by memorializing them with the following message. It said, we hope people who love this person uh, will find comfort in the things others share to remember and celebrate his or her life. Now, of course, those people, which included Mark Zuckerberg uh, himself, were actually very much alive. Facebook has since restored profiles to their normal state, as well as has issued an apology uh, for the error. And it occurred to me what, what kind of stinks about all this. Like, yeah, on one hand, it's funny, you know, that, that everybody's profile showed that they were, they were not alive anymore. On the other hand, anyone who actually, like, legitimately, that, you know, that, that was being used for their profile, like, it's very possible that people just would not have trusted it because all this was happening. So mm -hmm. that's really, really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I guess the reports of everyone's death have been greatly exaggerated. That's Apparently. what we learned. I, you know, I, part of me wants to believe that this was just like Facebook. That they did it on purpose. Like it's that a statement. it's just like, stop it. Like, we can control everything. Stop criticizing us, you people out there. We can like kill all of you if we want to. <laughs> and just be careful. Yeah, we, this is just a warning. This is a <laughs> shot across the bow. Yeah. Uh, what a weird mistake to make. My goodness. <laughs> like, that. that's just. You're like, you have one job. Yeah, technology's hard, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep realizing that every single day this week. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always, always take part in the show by emailing us, TNT at twit.tv. You can also leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. Wish your friends a merry Twitmas with our very own ugly Christmas sweater design. We're offering this exclusive design for a limited time. Uh, you can put it on a sweatshirt. You can put it on a t-shirt. You can put it on a tank top. Uh, if you uh, want to celebrate Twitmas like the rest of us <laughs> and run around saying merry Twitmas, then get this at teespring.com slash Twitmas and find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me to find out if I'm dead or alive, I'm at Megan Maroney. <laughs> and if you don't reply, then what will they assume? Well, that I'm, I don't know. That, that you're not alive yeah. anymore because yes, exactly. you couldn't reply. I reply to everyone. <laughs> that's true. That's so true. if so, if Megan doesn't reply to you, you know what happened. No, that's not true. Oh, okay, I read right. everything. I don't reply to everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't reply to everything either. Uh, it's, it's difficult. There's a lot of people out there. Uh, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole. Thanks to Mario for the words on the screen and helping out today. Thanks to Kevin for editing and making us look good, hopefully. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all on Monday. Bye, everyone.